They aim it above the hand so it reaches the top of the wooden pole and they shoot. Unless the horse does not run straight and at a moderate pace, it is impossible to shoot. Another rider should ride in front of the horse so the horse follows his horse well. They connect with the wooden pole above the hand. They should intensify the training so they master it. This is um, in English, uh, it's pop and jay shooting. Uh, they used to do it on church towers, not on horseback, but they would have if they'd known about that. Um, the idea of having somebody riding in front of you, so your horse follows that horse, there were incidents of horses running into the pole. Uh, and in Taibuka, he mentioned somebody by name who both the horse and the rider were killed from the impact. So it's a dangerous sport if it's not done correctly. Nowadays, when people do it, they have a fence and they have the pole on the other side of the fence so you can't accidentally run into the pole. But if you don't have that opportunity, then having somebody on a horse in front is good. Now, if you're having a contest and you've got three or four people shooting at it, you only need a horse in front of the first guy. <coughs> Um, it's he, he's basically saying you turn around, you, 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 your hand is lined up with the disc on top of the pole. On top of the disc is your, your um, bowl full of gold or precious silks or whatever. And the idea is to hit the disc, knock the, um, the thing off, or if it's sometimes they have little gold cages full of coins and you hit the gold cage. Sometimes they had little gold cages with the base of which was a spring when you hit the base of the cage, the cage popped open and it let a dove loose. Um, this was a big deal. You did it in front of the king. Uh, it was a demonstration of skill, timing. If you were good at this, everybody thought you were important. Uh, and that's the 12th chapter. And, and you'd think, well, that's all it is. Uh, but there's pages and pages after this. Um, he gives requirements for the archer. The first is talent, the second is interest, the third is equipment. The fourth is an encouraging master who teaches the whole set of equipment and techniques of archery to the student, and the student should also respect the master as required. The master should not refrain from teaching noble and good people. He should never teach infidels. We don't want them learning how to do this. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, the list, the, the list of four things is so you, you, you've got to have some talent. Uh, uh, you've got to be interested enough to put the effort into it. <laughs> you've got to have the equipment and you need somebody who can teach you. I saw all um, In the, the list of problems that he comes up with after, there is some really interesting stuff about trick shooting. Uh, I mean, we've got a lot on trick shooting from um, from uh, Arab archery. Even my uh, Abu Mon, is it Abu Mon? Abu Mon uh, is um, he puts a whole series of trick shooting things in there: the the shooting shower arrows, um, the shooting the egg full of naphtha with the hot coal in this little cone that follows it and sets it on fire. All this kind of wonderful stuff. Um, so this one has. It's problems. Those who have problems in archery have problems in shooting egg arrow and glass arrow. Now, he does explain it. This is much better. If someone shoots an arrow and pierces a glass with it, this lowly person pierces an anvil with it. So here he is saying, you know, you might be able to shoot a glass. I can shoot through an anvil. Um, well, this seems an impossible act, and no one believes it unless they see it. Uh, and then he goes on to describe it. The egg harrow has a, a, a narrow shaft similar to the atku. It should have no stains, and it should not be fletched. So we're talking about an unfletched arrow, perfect piece of wood. Um, it's like a long needle, right? <laughs> basically, uh, I don't know if I've got one. No, I haven't. Uh, basically like a, um, uh, a uh, the unfletched practice arrows that say the Ottomans use, like the, uh, the Torbagesi and the, and the Harbagesi. So they're, they're basically a stick with a knock on the end. Perfectly made, perfectly straight. Um, 
No fletching. There's a reason for this. You've got to be a really good archer to shoot unfletched arrows perfectly straight. You've got to practice a lot. You've got to have very good control. Uh, there are people I've seen demonstrating this on the internet, uh, and all I can say is it's really hard to do, and the, the people that do it are very good. Um, so he says, they place a raw egg on a wooden pole. Now, this already starts to sound a bit interesting. This could be a bit of fun. And stick the egg with moist mud so that the egg stays tight. So we've got a pole with an egg on top. What could go wrong? Uh, <laughs> The bow should have short limbs and be very soft. So we're talking about uh, effectively a practice bow. Uh, it's it's um, you wouldn't use it in warfare. You wouldn't even use it in target archery. It's it's so weak. He should stay away from the target with the distance of one bow. Now, does he mean the he's staying the distance of a strung bow length from the target? So he stands there, and then if you measured from his hand to the target, it would be one bow length. Don't know. Um, it certainly wouldn't be a bow shot, so that's probably, he means you stand quite close to the target. He places his left leg behind, puts the right leg forward, bends his left knee and draws the bow slowly and keeps bending his left knee but does not rest it on the ground. He the, draws the bow a bit so that it is rounded, holds his breath and shoots the arrow which will pass through the egg in a straight line. So that's the purpose of this game is to make a hole that goes straight through your egg. Now, this, he doesn't go into any other detail. Is it a boiled egg, for instance, which it would be easy to do? Maybe it isn't. I haven't tried this. Eggs are cheap. I should really do it. But what a mess it's going to make. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just wondering, wouldn't it, like, impact, just break and make it load right well it depends on the shape of the arrowhead uh, i had a discussion with a, a friend of my archery club many years ago and he said they used to shoot uh 22 caliber uh rifles at glass bottles and he said if you shot an ordinary shaped bullet at it the bottle would shatter but if you had a flattened headed bu bullet the um it would just punch a hole through it without shattering the glass. And maybe this is what they're doing. Uh, this, I'm just trying to see if I've got one around. You can buy um, um, these little steel blunts that screw into uh, carbon arrows. And they're just a cylinder and they're just flat across the face. And they'd be perfect for this, if in fact um, that's what they do. Then he goes, to shoot a poplar arrow through a wooden board, they should make the tip of the poplar arrow like a fishback and place some wax on its tip. Now, I've got arrows that they call fishback arrows, and they're like a bodkin in the front, but then the two, uh, two edges that would normally go back are carved away, which is the fish head. I mean, you turn it sideways so it looks like a fish's head. Yeah. Uh, these would punch through almost anything, but... Once the first part of the arrowhead goes through, there's no drag because the rest of the arrowhead is narrow. And uh, they, uh, they put some wax on its tip. I think, uh, I think Todd Todeskeni uh, on YouTube has experimented with shooting waxed arrowheads and they actually penetrate better than a dry arrowhead. Just a little bit of... Um, of lubrication. So here's something backing that up. They shoot at a wooden board with a thickness of two fingers. So we're talking about four centimeters. The wooden board should not be hard because we actually want to make a hole through it. We don't want to demonstrate how strong we are. Uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful stuff. From here on, um, it's a really technical description of things that go wrong and what things you should tense and what things you shouldn't tense. Um, like the three things which should be kept tight. First, the bow grip should be kept tight. Second, the, and there's a word missing, should be kept tight. And third, when opening the right leg, it should be kept tight on the ground. Um, 
the right leg is usually the back leg. Um, so they're, they're saying keep it tense. They say that the left foot, you should be just balancing on the ball of the foot and the leg should be slightly bent. Um, I was trying this um, on Sunday. We, we're only shooting at 20 metres and in a strong crosswind. But that, that actual thing of keeping the right leg back and straight and, and standing on the ball of the foot, you, you kind of rock forward as you shoot. It is actually quite good for your accuracy when you remember yeah. to do it. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's a good thing. <clears throat> The three things that should be kept loose are first, the left side of the body. Second, the index finger of the hand grasping the bow. And the bow handle, he, he says, and entering the bow arm. So uh, I don't know, entering the bow arms, I think is that process of starting the drawing of bow. But how that should be loose, I, I'm not quite sure. I know when you do it, you feel you're not forcing anything. So maybe it's, it, uh, that actually feels like a very natural motion. So I don't know. Things that should be kept straight. First, the right part of the, right part of the face, which I assume means the right side of the face. Second, the aiming should be straight. Well, that's logical. Third, the tip of the right elbow should be kept straight, which means it shouldn't be up. It shouldn't be down. It should be straight, this part. So this... This again, this is something that all the manuscripts agree is a good idea. The three things that should be kept in one line. First, both sides of the body should be kept in line. Second, both eyes. Third, both arms. So this is it. The arms are in line. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. Um, the both sides of the body should be kept in line. He might be talking about lining the body up obliquely to the target, which is one of the standard methods of shooting. Uh, and uh, the, the eyes, well, you know, obviously you're lined up in the... Uh, he may also mean that you shouldn't tilt the head so that the, the eyes are in a horizontal plane. Don't know. Um, then he goes on. There are eight other principles of archery. And my text has frozen. Everything's, uh, oh, I see. I see. Uh, first standing, second the thumb, third the grasp, fourth drawing, fifth aiming, sixth shooting, seventh the bow and arrow, and third the thumb ring, meaning the thumb. Um, he, there's, a, there's a little bit of, of, of um, uh, uh, description here that, you don't see very often, and it's worthwhile just mentioning. He says, when the archer starts to shoot a bow for the first, he folds the left cup and wraps it around the arm. He, he might, be, bearing in mind, people usually wore clothes where the sleeves were longer than their arms. And he might mean you fold it back to keep it out of the way. Uh, Arab archery famously quotes an Abbasid source, which it doesn't identify. Uh, saying that the Persians used to uh, shoot with one sleeve cut off and one really long sleeve. So when they released the arrow, that sleeve would cover their hand because the, they considered that the, uh, the right arm being bared was being naked and the left arm was okay, it didn't matter. <laughs> so uh, that's a, yeah, well, we don't know how that got there. Um, and... Uh, there should be a distance of one arrow length between the left foot and the opposite thigh. Not quite sure what he means by that. He should stand so strongly that if someone hits him on the back with a hand, he does not move at all. Mm. Now that is reasonable and that's a um, focus on the fact that you, you should be very stable. You shouldn't be... Yeah. Because... Well, again, when I was shooting on Sunday, the wind was so strong, people were actually blowing backwards and forwards. You could see somebody would get, oh, this is you know, Western Archery, yeah. they would get to full draw and their bows, because of the large size of the risers and everything, were actually being moved by the wind. Yeah, yes. And, and I mean, that makes it hard to shoot. I mean, obviously, it wasn't good shooting conditions anyway. So, but uh, Danny says, and these two statements are important. Uh, drawing and power are of three types. Abu Saidi, Bahrami, and Vakasi. So Abu Saidi is Abu Said, 
Um, I think he's mentioned later on and explains who he is. Bahram is Bahram Bur, um, the, the Sasanian king, who was uh, associated with certain types of uh, thumb draw that weren't actually used during his time, but it doesn't matter. The, the, uh, the interpretation is there. Vakasi is Saad ibn Abi Vakas, yes, who was a yes, companion of the prophet and a famous archer. And there is a bow, I think, in Medina, uh, which is said to be his bow. Yeah. Um, uh, whether it is his bow or uh, it, it I, I don't know. I, I mean, it, it, that was a long time ago. It's, a, it's quite an interesting bow. Uh, it's got very interesting tips. Uh, there are some Turkish bows I've seen made with tips in that shape. They're just regular Turkish bows, but they've got these big curled over tips. Um, that might be that that bow was known back in, because these bows were from the 18th century. But back in the 18th century, that was a known thing, that uh, this type of tip was related to um, Saad uh, ibn Abu Waqqas. Um, then he says, in line with the thumb is Abu Saidi, but there are differences. The best thumb drawer is Abu Saidi style, which uh, consists of the way of locking the thumb. The tip of the index finger is placed outside of the bowstring. So inside and outside the bowstring in this context, um, inside the bowstring is if the bowstring goes down there and your index finger is between the bowstring and the bow. Yeah. Outside is when the, the bowstring would go straight past your index finger without touching it. Um, and uh, the end of the thumbnail is placed behind the index finger in a way that the index finger nail is completely visible. So you're not doing that. If you were doing that, you can't see the index finger nail. If you're doing that so that it's resting on the thumb, you can see the nail. I think that's what they're talking about. This is quite a common thing that's discussed. Um, it's certainly mentioned in Taibuka. Um, this is exaggerated a bit, but it means you should place, he said, place behind the index finger. I think he means place the thumb behind the index finger. But again, these, it's not really clear. I think as, as people that have read a lot of these manuscripts now, and also have read the Arab and the Turkish one, um, you think you know what's going on because you've seen a lot of these references and it fits together in your head. But that might be because they're all quoting from similar authorities and none of them actually means precisely what the words say. They're just using the words to describe something that they're doing and make it seem more authentic because they're using the words of uh, you know, a great author or something. Then he says there are different uh, types of grasping the bow grip, uh, Taheri, Vakasi, and Eshaki. Well, Taheri is Tahir Abalki, um, Saad ibn Abi Wakas, and uh, Ishak Araka. So um, it's interesting that th there's a whole school uh, for Saad, which isn't generally mentioned in the other manuscripts. But I mean, he was a very important archer, so it's quite reasonable. Um, Eshaq, Taheri, these are well-known masters and they're mentioned in almost all the books. Uh, the grasp Taheri is called round fist and is attributed to Taher Balki. The Eshaqi uh, grasp is hawk's claw grasp and it's used by the Turks, which is interesting because all the other Persian manuscripts say the Persians used the hawk's claw. Yes, <laughs> right. Hawk's claw. <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, again, it could be a difference. He, he's moved down to um, down, down to India and he's, he's seeing different things and different people. I don't know. Um, but then he, the uh, Bahami, Bahrami, Bahrami grip is even, um, so it's not forward like the, the, yeah. the hooks one. Yeah. And then he says there are two different grasps, grasps from these. One is the lion's grasp, where all five fingers are used in this grasp. Most people who are not proficient are using this type of grasp. <laughs> so he's saying the lion's grasp is what the uneducated archer uses. And he's saying it's all five fingers. Now, my guess is that 
the four fingers are around the grip and the thumb is resting on the index finger on the top of it. So it's also touching the grip. And this is what um, uh, that um, um, uh, Mustafa Kani says, some people grip a bow like they're gripping a stick. So it's a hammer grip. And he says, these people don't know anything about archery. So it was a common thing to criticize people for. Uh, Maybe they just mean the naive group. Um, the other type is moraba, the square grasp, which requires holding the small finger, the ring finger, the index finger, and the thumb grasping the bow grip. Most people of this craft, that is archery, from Lahore, use this grasp, especially when shooting a heavy arrow. Now, what he's talking about is when you grasp with the three lower fingers, and put the thumb against the grip on top of the side of the middle finger. This is quite a practical grasp, and depending on how far your wrist is forward or back, you've got different you know, advantages from it. Uh, it's interesting he associates it with Lahore. Uh, the best type of grasping is Taheri, which requires holding the back of the bow between the fingers of the left hand, pressed against the proximal phalanges. This is this part of the hand here. Yeah. Um, if they grasp the bow grip loosely in this type of grasping, the hand will be injured. So you've got to actually hold it tight. And the arrow will fly weakly. And it does not fly fast. Some people said that the in index finger should, be, should not be held inside. Uh, so they're saying there's a possibility that the index finger can be inside the thumb, I think. Or uh, a lot of other treaties say it should be on the back of the bow out of the way. He, mean, he may mean that, he may mean something else. Um, he also says that you're holding the bow so tightly that it's like the tips of the fingers are going to bleed. Uh, this is common again in other manuals from different places. Uh, the, this, this thought that you should hold the bow grip very tightly with the lower three fingers. Uh, in, in, um, in Mustafa Kani, he says that the tightness that you hold a bow with should be proportional to the weight of the bow. So the heavier the bow, the tighter you hold it. And whereas I've never shot many heavy bows, um, I, I shot an 80 pound bow for about an hour once using that style of grip and, and my hand was perfectly stable. But because I wasn't taking my hand off the bow when I was taking the arrows out of the target, after an hour, my hand was actually frozen to the bow. <laughs> I had to peel my fingers off. Um, but it, it really, there was no, there was no uh, um, movement in the bow hand. There was no um, uh, kick from the bow, nothing. It was really, but that's, uh, you know, I, I don't think I can do that anymore. If the arrow tends to the right, they should turn the right leg to the left. If the arrow tends to the left, they should turn the left leg to the right. If they place the thumb of the drawing hand above the bow grip, the arrow will fly low. By which he means, if you're at full draw and your thumb on your drawing hand is higher than your hand on the bow grip, then the arrow is pointing down. Um, which is one of the reasons that they're so careful about making sure everything's level. Um, therefore, the arrowhead, the bow grip, the thumb and the elbow, this elbow, should be in the same line. And it goes on, 12 important requirements, grasping the bow grip, shooting hard, aiming at the target in a straight line, shooting with proper technique, aiming even if the enemy is in front, <coughs> by which I, mean, I think he means close up. Getting out of the bow like a champion. Getting, oh, six is deportment. So you should always, you know, be proper. You don't want to look like, you know, you're some kind of peasant or anything. <laughs> uh, you should, uh, getting out of the bow like a champion. I, exiting the bow is terminology, which we think means the beginning of the follow through. Yeah. But we don't know for sure. Doing it like a champion, maybe it's this whole flurrying the arm back and looking really impressive. I don't know. It could very well be that. Um, the eighth is 
stomping the foot leg on the ground. This is what we were talking about when you lifted your foot onto the ball thing and you shoot, you mm -hmm. drop the back of the foot onto the ground. Um, ninth, having adequate equipment. Well, that's important. Tenth, respecting the bow. <coughs> that has several levels. One is respecting how dangerous the bow can be to you. So don't hold it incorrectly and slap yourself on the arm or something. Uh, the second one is respecting the bow as it's a, a, an implement of power, and you should show respect to it for that reason. And the third is because it was highly regarded by the prophet, and so for it has a religious connotation as well. So there's a lot of reasons to respect the bow. Uh, the eleventh is having performed ablution. So you wanted to be in a ritual state of cleanliness when you shot, so that God would look kindly upon you. Indeed, I have a Safavid period. I haven't translated it yet. Um, archery, I need to man, uh, translate so we can work on it. But so the guy always talks about ritual cleaning. So he describes it. Then he goes to the bow, he describes the bow techniques. Oh, no, then we need to clean before I go. Then he starts to another ritual cleaning. Then he goes back to shooting. Then another, and I say, God damn it, why can't you separate ritual cleaning from shooting? And he goes back and forth through the whole manuscript. It is so strange. I don't. I mean, this is a very strange manuscript. Well, well I mean, there uh, you can have ritual cleaning where you uh, become ritual clean, and then you go and get your bow and you shoot. And assuming then that you stay ritually clean, because shooting a bow will not um, pollute you. But maybe this guy has has a problem, and he's like people that have a problem with cleanliness where they're always washing their hands and everything like that. <laughs> this might be a psychological comment rather than a technical <laughs> one. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. Interesting, This yeah. is the kind of thing, you know, uh, and it, when it's all translated and we've thought about it, there may be something underlying this, yeah. which is not archery, but is religion, and he may think that he's found a way of better um, dealing with uh, purity and whatnot. The twelfth is saying, in the name of God and thanks to God. They say that another uh, prerequisite for drawing the bow is to draw it slowly so that it's done right. He does stress with light bows that you should draw them slowly. Um, so he's not, he, this is to get yourself into balance. It's not like you're in battle and there's a guy there and you've just got to shoot him. It's, you've got to keep yourself in balance. And particularly, this would be true for target archery. Uh, if, if you don't have that balance and calm, if you're hurrying any part of the shooting process, then things will go wrong. You make mistakes when you try and hurry. Even if you know what you're doing, you still will make mistakes. Uh, then he goes on. This actually goes on quite a lot. Um, mistakes make the arrow shake. He gives you three of those. Deficiencies within the arrow, he gives you th uh, six of those, including the knock is too wide, the arrowhead's too heavy, all that kind of stuff. Deficiencies in the bow, bad bowstring, uh, different size loops on the bowstring, so the top one is big and the bottom one is small. Yeah. Uh, uneven bowstring, this is where its thickness is different, uh, so it's not made. Uh, the bow is damp. Uh, the bow becomes one arm. Uh, the, according to the digital uh, uh, lexicon of the Choda, this is when the ears at the end of the bow limbs become one straight line with the bow limbs close to each side of the bow handle. It just flattens out, flattens out. which means that what, what the Turks call the Kassan eye is too weak. Yeah. Um, in crab bows, in the typical Indian crab bows, uh, that point where the bow limb makes a sharp, almost right angle turn, it looks really quite thick and solid. But when you cut one open, there's only a very thin wooden core in there. And that whole thickness is built up of sinew, which doesn't have structural strength. So those bows would actually bend quite a lot where the bow limb meets the um, ear. And he's possibly talking about bows built that way where they've skimped and haven't put enough core material in there and the whole thing. It looks really good when you string it, but when you get to full draw, it just flattens out. Uh, certainly, it's something that'd be worthwhile if, we ever get, if I ever get around to trying to make one of those bows. 
Uh, so, again, you know, the, there's lots of little bits in here and they're all useful. Um, if there's a break in the bow too, this means uh, the bow's not going to shoot normally if there's a crack in the sinew line. In fact, the bow will eventually shatter. Um, I've had this happen with a horn and sinew bow when I got to full draw and it broke into three pieces. And we knew that there was a little bit of sinew lifting on the back at one point and we glued it back down again, but it went off like a bomb uh, and, and uh, drew blood from two people, me being one and the owner being the other. Um, which always, it, 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 it should teach you, don't lend your bow to somebody else because they might be stronger than you are and draw it farther than it should be. Uh, yeah, I'm still embarrassed about that. Then there's, there's some, the, the last part of this is anecdotes about Ali yeah. and uh, Saad ibn Abi Waqaf. Um, and, and also uh, how the grasp of the bow was caused by the magical grip of the hand of, of Mortez Ali. Um, so uh, this is ethnographic. Um, Saad ibn Waqaf was one of the 10 uh, followers who would be in paradise, was very proficient in the art of archery and lived in that unique and best era. Had the illusion, this is sad, that no one was born in the world who was as proficient at archery as he was. Uh, and then uh, Ali, the son of Talib, uh, the conqueror of lands, was informed about Saad's opinion and asked Saad to go and shoot with him with their bows. Saad accepted the offer and ordered that a rice salver should be hung from a large tree during the dark of night for a, from a distance of 250 paces. This is the distance where a fast riding messenger could not distinguish between two jars full of straw from each other and so they started to shoot from this distance. Basically you couldn't really discern the target. It was effectively invisible. But it was available, you could hit it. Um, they ordered a man to get close to the tree and throw a stone at the salver so that it would make a sound. This is starting to sound like a really good archery story, isn't it? Um, <laughs> it's beautiful. Immediately after the sound, the bowstring of the best archer of the period, that is Saad, shot three arrows, each making three sounds from the salver. The king of men robbed the hand of God behind the bow and shot at the target and pierced it and went through the other side. He then shot two other arrows consecutively, which did not make any sounds. Saad, who thought that the other two arrows had not made any sounds and hence missed the target, told the ruler of the country, let's go and look at the arrows and find out what happened, thinking oh, I've won. Um, the shots of Saad created three holes in the silver. Uh, what Hazrati Ali had done was create one hole as all three arrows had passed through the same hole. Um, and, uh, da, 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 da. and the arrowheads of the two arrows attached to the knocks of the other arrows, making three one arrow. So <laughs> what we call in modern archery of Robin Hood, he'd managed to get three arrows, go through the same hole, and one after the other hit the knock of the one in front of it, which is how he could prove they'd all gone through the same hole. Um, Saad was very surprised, as would anybody be. The leader of the believers said that God, that God who created the world below and the world above, always created someone more proficient than the other in any craft. So basically, don't think you're that smart. There's always going to be somebody a bit smarter. Beautiful um, story. <laughs> it is a good story, isn't it? It is. This way, they had learned the, the science of fame, uh, which... Saad was famous as this great archer, but Ali proved that he was in doubt. Uh, this is really amazing because, uh, again, on Sunday, one of my uh, colleagues was shooting with me, and he, he actually did this to one of his arrows, but uh, he, these were, it was two carbon arrows, so it entered, it destroyed the knock of the arrow in the target, entered the, the, the hollow of the arrow, came out the side, hit the target, and then was pushed around and re-entered the arrow inside the target. So when it came out, it was like stitched through the arrow. 
And we kind of all looked at that and he's going, oh, you know, because these are expensive arrows. These aren't cheap arrows because cheap arrows don't go that straight. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's pretty amazing when you see it. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a quite complicated description of the names of the bow. Um, and uh, the, uh, I think it's actually talking about the weight of the bow. It was very complicated when, when you translated it. And we had to look up um, uh, weights and measures in the Mughal Empire to work out, because these weren't um, Persian measures. And uh, effectively, it, it, um, they're talking about weighing the bowstring, weighing the bow. And... Uh, the, the, they're relating the weight of the bow to the bowstring, but it's just too complicated to explain. And then he says, uh, I am the sinful slave in the blessed month of Ramadan, the year 1212. Uh, now, before that, at the very end, it says the year 1191, which is 1771, 72. And uh, then um, it's got this other date, which is... is um, uh, 120 years later or something like that. Oh, sorry, 20 years later. 20 years later. 20 years later. Um, and then it's got Orang Vasal Shirazi. Now, we know that it was written by Muhammad Zaman. Orang Vasal Shirazi was a poet. Um, and and uh, he's, this, he's saying this is either he copied it himself or the copy was given to him yeah. or made for him. So he's saying, right, I... Now have this. So uh, this is showing that this this manual um, passed from hand to hand. See, sometimes you don't know if there's only one copy. In the case of uh, Taibuka in 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 uh, the Saracen archery, there were dozens of copies because it kept getting copied, and of course each copy was slightly different from the last. So when you get the original one, it's really good. In this case, it looks like even though this is a second copy or a third copy. Uh, because the original wasn't properly edited, it's retained a lot of, you know, the original material. They haven't tried to clean it up. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is, this is, we're looking at about 220, 230 years old, minimum. Um, a lot of the information in there we can relate to real bows and arrows. A lot of the techniques make perfect sense. Yeah. Um, it's really quite an interesting manuscript. There, there is material in here that's valuable to archers now and valuable to bowyers and, and valuable to people making strings and all this kind of stuff because we're getting measurements, we're getting descriptions. Um, and as I say, we'll, I'll sit down with a bow and I'll go through all those measurements and, and I'll, I'll, I'll film it and we'll see how close it comes to a real bow from the period that this was, was done. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's, it's the voice of the past speaking directly to us. Because we don't understand everything, it doesn't mean that it's not valuable. Um, we, we, we often don't understand things. <laughs> and, I mean, even when, it's, even when it's clear, people still misunderstand stuff. And, and I mean, arch, archery, technically, I, I, I compare it to math. Mathematics is complex. If you don't practice it, you lose your ability to do it, but you still retain, retain the knowledge that it can do the things that it can do. And archery is like that. If you don't practice it, you lose your ability to do it. You can regain it by practicing, but you do lose it for that time period. But in your mind, if you, you may be an old man writing down a book, you will have knowledge that you gained when you were practicing that will come out when you write. It's not, it, you, don't, you don't lose your ability to, to transmit the knowledge because you're old and you're no longer practicing. You know, uh, Bede, I don't know if I mentioned that in our last interview, but I mean, I never forget these moments, which I really appreciate. I was talking, I think it was on this channel, it was here with uh, Brian Fahimi, who is an Iranian-American welding engineer and an engineer. So he's fluent in Persian and in English, a very good welding engineer and metallurgist. And he told me 
we measure everything as mes- as metallurgists, as engineer, everything beautiful. This is crucible steel. I can measure everything. Back then they couldn't, this and that. And look, he's talking, I said, I'm talking as an Iranian American, right? Proud, a dude, ha, who he, but no one can reproduce as beautiful as those guys did. Do you know why? He asked me. I said, no, Brian, why? Because we forget they were not engineers, they were artists. Then go and yeah. copy Picasso. Go and measure. I said, and I never forget. This is beautiful. But I saw greetings to Brian for saying that. He said, go and measure Picasso. It is painted like that. Write academic articles on that. Beautiful. It is the material is that. But reproduce Rembrandt, reproduce Picasso, can you? That's what we don't, for, we keep forgetting. Those guys were artists, not welding engineers, not metallurgists, you know? And I never forget that. This is beautiful, right? Isn't it, Beat? So, so. Ah, it, it is. What, what, I, what always amazes me is we, we, we talk about, say, Al Kindi writing about swords or, or something like that. And you say, ah, oh, well, he, he didn't understand this or he didn't understand that. But the fact was, he was a scholar watching craftsmen. When I go and watch craftsmen make things, when anyone goes on YouTube and watch craftsmen make things, you appreciate their skill and their knowledge. Yeah. You can't just <laughs> copy it. Yeah. You can learn things, but, I mean, you know, I, I, we, we were talking about me making a shoe, right? Yeah. Now, I... I saw some YouTube videos from Pakistan of people making shoes. Now, I'd seen these shoes because people bring them back as presents and whatever. And I thought, yeah, that's very interesting. Now, I've got 40 years of leatherworking behind me. Yeah. It didn't take me long to work out what they were doing. It didn't take me long to work out a way of adapting their system to what I could do because there are some things I can't do. Um, and... So therefore, I could go off and make a pair of shoes. But if uh, if I didn't have that experience, there'd be real problems. It's like, you know, some things uh, I didn't even know I could do until I, I, I was using another technique that's not related to that, but it, it was to stitch a small section together and I didn't want any stitching on the inside because that's where your heel rubs. And... Um, I didn't even know whether this leather could handle that type of pressure. I tried it and it worked. It's not because I'm brilliant. It's because it, the material could support that thing. Yeah. This is when a person makes a bow. And I mean, I know quite a few bows, quite a few good bows. Um, when a person makes a bow, they never know until it's finished whether that piece of core wood they put in there is going to retain its characteristics. Yeah. When you make a, 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 a composite bow, usually, unless, unless it's a Manchu style bow um, or, or, a, or some of the Ming bows, usually the core is made from a, a separate hand grip and two pieces for the limbs and then two other pieces for the ears. Those two pieces for the limbs they get put inside the horn and the sinew and everything like that. If one of them has a different stiffness to the other, that makes a difference to the bow. I mean, you can correct it, but you don't want that to happen. The, the ability to judge your materials is as important as the ability to carve them out and, and do all that kind of stuff. People it, is like, it is like that many people who uh, don't do uh, cutting tasks or do practice swordsmanship don't understand they just say, well, I buy a trainer sword, it's well made, then I will have an edge put on it. And we say, no, a sword which is forged with an edge acts differently if you buy a trainer and later well, yeah. put an edge, right? Well, the thing that, that, that always um, I found depressing about, this is years ago, Not I don't know if it's the same now, but uh, people would make complex sword blades by what we call stock removal. So you would have your blank and then you would grind out the bits that didn't look like the swords you wanted. Whereas the people that made those swords did it by forging, which compressed the metal into these grooves. Yes. And uh, this is entirely different. 
and it produces a different structure. And when you hit things with it, it behaves differently. Yes. The first one behaves like a block of lead. The second one cuts through things really easily. Yeah. And I, we, we used to play around with a lot of swords. We saw a lot of swords, uh, my friends and I, thanks to some of our friends who were collectors and had, you know, lots of swords were available to look at. And it was so easy to pick the good ones from the bad ones. Because the bad ones either felt flimsy or felt like pieces of lead. The good yeah. ones moved wherever you moved them. And you didn't have to, I mean, you couldn't fight with them efficiently unless you were trained. But you could feel that they moved with your body as opposed to the ones that just <laughs> dragged or just weren't there. I mean, I've seen swords that if you, um, had to defend yourself with the tennis racket, the tennis racket would bounce the blade off because they were so flimsy <laughs> and, and so pointless. They had very nice hilts, so they had very nice scabbards, but they were totally useless as a weapon. Yeah. I've seen other swords that look very, very plain, and uh, you could cut through anything with them if you were within reason, um, certainly anything that you were trying to kill. And uh, these... The, the the practical differences are fairly subtle. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Oh, yeah, it, it's it's really quite interesting. Uh, and this is this is wonderfully true about bows. I picked up bows from the same factory. Two bows, exactly the same shape, the same weight. One shot like a dream, and one was a dog. Yeah, that's right. And and you you know I, I when people order bows on the internet. I, my experience has been good, except for the dog, but that was my own fault. Uh, but, uh, but when you think about it, uh, in the old days, if the bow didn't work, you'd go around to that guy's place and beat up his cow or something just to show him how much he didn't like it. <laughs> there's a, there's, a, there's a, a famous old black and white Turkish movie about a uh, sword maker who makes a sword and the guy comes back from battle or, and then the sword broke. So he cuts his own arm off in punishment because he was so embarrassed <laughs> that he made such a bad sword. <laughs> um, so, you know, like yeah. people put their hearts into what they were making. Yes, that's right. And, Thank uh, you very much, Pete. It was a beautiful discussion. Very long manuscript of Zaman. Lots of oh. information. I remember how much we worked on this one. God, this was really tough game, really. But valuable yeah. information really valuable information uh, it was it was it, we we learned a lot from it yeah a, a lot of that stuff becomes internalized when you're working on it and 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 it creeps into your archery practice too <laughs> it does so, uh, it does <laughs> thank you very much Mead. i wish you a nice day then thank you you too